Uh, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I, I, I'm sorry I have to make one correction. Uh, I don't work for the Naval Security Agency. It's the National Security Agency. Uh, some of you may have heard of it uh, already. Uh, but I would like to thank, uh, thank you for the, the welcome. I'd like to thank those who invited me and the staff people who made my visit possible. It's an honor to be here, and I'm very happy to be able to talk on this important anniversary. We are commemorating not just a victory, but one of the great battles in world history and a victory uh, for our side. We are commemorating, memorializing those who sacrificed their lives for us at this battle. Now I'm making the assumption that everyone sitting in this room knows more about the Battle of Midway than I do from an operational standpoint. Uh, if you don't, uh, shame on you. Uh, but uh, I would like to address um, one of the aspects of the battle that is often uh, sidelined or little known, and that is the communications intelligence uh, side of it. Sometimes uh, Midway is referred to as a miracle victory. I don't think there was a miracle about it. It was a hard fight. Certainly, American forces got some unexpected breaks by bad decisions made by our adversary. But it was won not because of some sort of uh, supernatural miracle, but through the hard work, the sacrifice, the daring of those who fought the battle. But for those who fight the battle, there's got to be background information. There's got to be intelligence. For most of American history, it comes as something of a surprise to many people, the United States has not been interested in intelligence activities. It's, it's really kind of ironic with all the uh, budget assets expended on it today with the fact that uh, the government seems obsessed with it, and our government obsession with it is exceeded only by the uh, obsession of the media with intelligence activities. That this has not been a major part of uh, American life um, until about 1941-42. Uh, until that time, it was a small effort carried out by a number of uh, highly uh, trained uh, professionals, or high, should, perhaps I should say highly experienced uh, professionals, but they had to prove themselves before it could be used. And that's part of the story today. We can't just walk into the Battle of Midway uh, story uh, without some preparation on the intelligence background. Since World War II, the United States has not been without intelligence activities or intelligence agencies. But prior to World War II, career-minded officers did not go into intelligence. They went into one or another branch of the combat arms, left uh, intelligence, uh, if it was done at all, uh, to the wimps. But the wimps turned out to have uh, an absolutely essential part of the, uh, of the story. In the 1930s, the U.S. military was beginning to remake itself. A recognition by most senior officers in the Army and the Navy that the world was changing. It was becoming a much more dangerous place. Uh, and the United States might not be able to avoid uh, a future war. Then uh, Lieutenant Commander Lawrence Safford had a vision of his own. From the late 1920s, he lobbied the Chief of Naval Operations to start a code-breaking operation within the U.S. Navy. <clears throat> he um, argued that code-breaking had been important in World War I, if the U.S. became involved in another war, uh, 
uh, we would need it again. It behooved us in time of peace to begin training a, at least a cadre organization that could expand rapidly should war come. The CNO uh, saw the wisdom of this and authorized Safford to uh, establish what was first known as the research desk. It was renamed OP20G uh, soon after. That designation meant that it was part of the CNO's uh, staff. In both the Army and the Navy, as a sidelight, the code-breaking organizations were not subordinate to military intelligence. They were subordinate in the Army to the Signal Corps and in the Navy to the uh, Chief of uh, Naval Operations Staff. This required uh, quite a number of uh, organizational contortions uh, when war came uh, in order to provide the code-breaking organizations with the requirements needed and to uh, facilitate the movement of intelligence from them. The Navy required that all its codebreakers be active duty officers. It was done down in the depths of the uh, District of Columbia. This is the old Army Navy building. It's now in the approximate location of the, what is now the Vietnam Memorial. Uh, but it was uh, an active office building until the end of World War II. Just about the time of the Battle of Midway, the um, Navy Cryptologic Organization moved to a new home on Nebraska Avenue in the District of Columbia. This was a former girls' school that was taken over uh, as the Navy's cryptologic headquarters. <clears throat> Today it is the headquarters of the Homeland Security Department but I was there about a year and a half ago, and many of the street names and a couple of the building names still reflect its Navy heritage. One of the uh, great uh, features of cryptologic activities, that is dealing with codes and ciphers, is that it attracts a lot of eccentrics. Uh, Thomas Dyer, whom you see, uh, on the right, uh, worked in cryptology from his early days as uh, a lieutenant, but uh, eventually rose to captain. He had a sign on his desk wherever he went that said, you don't have to be crazy to work here, but it certainly helps. Joseph Wenger was a man uh, who had had his sense of humor surgically removed. Uh, he was all business, and it may be for that reason that he became the first uh, codebreaker to achieve flag rank. All of them were business, but uh, business-oriented. They stuck to the mission, but in many cases, they uh, found the fun in what they did as well. Cryptology has a way of getting into your blood. Now, the uh, Navy requirement was that all its cryptanalysts, or code breakers as we might call them, had to be active duty officers, which meant in those days all male, all white. The one exception being a civilian female named Agnes Driscoll. She was the best of them all. They used her to train her male colleagues in how to break codes. She had been working in cryptology in one guise or another since World War I. She had had some private business experience in cryptology as well, uh, thoroughly understood the business. In the 1930s, as the uh, Navy organization solved some uh, Japanese training codes, certainly the reports on this were signed by the male officers uh, in charge of the organization, but in one of them they remarked, the first break into this difficult training code system used by the Japanese was made by Mrs. Driscoll, as usual. Uh, she really was the best. The Navy also had a vigorous program for language analysts. Officers would be dropped into a native environment. They would live on the economy in a particular country 
uh, they would study with a tutor. And if they didn't uh, mess up on examinations or cause trouble otherwise, they would live two years on the economy and come back fairly fluent in the, uh, in the language. The Navy's uh, concentration was uh, on Japan. It had several officers living in Tokyo. They studied with a tutor named Naganuma, who taught them to read newspaper-level Japanese, which is what uh, turned out to be the um, level of writing that uh, Japanese naval reports were written in. One uh, veteran of that program wrote a rather overheated article calling uh, Mr. Naganuma the, the man who lost the war for Japan by training so many foreigners in the language. Uh, that's a bit overstatement, but certainly the fact that we had uh, officers fluent in Japanese was exceedingly important. What we are talking about in, when we talk about this cryptologic organization, OP20G, is communications intelligence, usually referred to by its acronym COMMENT. This is a unique source of intelligence. It is not filtered through reports by spies or other observers who may be unreliable or have particular agenda of their own. This is what an adversary says to himself. This is taking his own communications and uh, turning them back against him. There are two related disciplines. One is called traffic analysis, and this was referred to in the uh, good introduction. Uh, this is analyzing the pattern of communications, which can uh, teach you things about the adversary's order of battle, about his locations, uh, about his uh, priorities, even if you cannot solve the message uh, lying underneath. And direction finding, which is to uh, determine the angle from which uh, an enemy signal is coming. If you can do this from three locations, it's a simple mathematical formula to determine where the enemy uh, transmitter is. At the same time, the CNO authorized uh, Safford to uh, begin this research desk, or OP20G, he also authorized Safford to select some of the best radio men in the American Pacific Fleet and train them in how to eavesdrop on Japanese communications. Code-breaking skill, no matter how highly developed, doesn't matter if you don't have the raw material to work on. So they selected first uh, about uh, 10 radio men, ran successive classes of about 10 to a dozen at the um, Navy building that I picked and showed the picture of in downtown DC. Because it was a secret activity, they didn't have cleared spaces the way we do today, no, no such thing as a vault. Uh, they built a, a wooden shack on top of the uh, uh, Navy building where they held their classes. This led to the group being called the On the Roof Gang. I mean, you had to call them something. And uh, this was a nickname, and it became one of the more exclusive clubs in the Navy. They were deployed overseas, as well as a few places around the United States, to eavesdrop on Japanese communications. Now, I should point out the Japanese were doing the same thing, but we were better, and we had better locations. We also had a, a ship bristling with antennas that we would sail through the Japanese fleet when it was conducting uh, war games or maneuvers. This collected all kinds of good information, but it also had the effect of tipping off the Japanese to uh, what we were doing. The material from these overseas sites was sent back to Washington, D.C. for processing by the famous China Clipper. This was a um, 
process that did not depend on speed. I think one of the important things to remember about all intelligence activities, but particularly about communications intelligence activities, is that in the 1930s and 40s, and today, it requires something that in all our abundance the United States has very little of, and that's patience. The activity has to be undertaken without a guarantee of results. It has to be flexible, and it generally takes a lot of time uh, to build up the expertise, to build up the knowledge, to be able to read an adversary's communications. That was certainly true in the uh, paper and pencil era of the 1930s and 1940s, but it is still uh, even true in the computer age today. Uh, there's all, never any guarantee of success, no matter how powerful our computers, and it still is likely uh, to take a lot of time with uh, false starts uh, and uh, just general building up of knowledge. The Japanese conducted uh, triennial grand maneuvers, and in the years in between, they would conduct localized maneuvers. The U.S. Navy cryptologic organization studied these to a fairly well. Sometimes it would study them uh, from different perspectives. One year, they decided not to try breaking any of the Japanese training codes, just to study it from a traffic analysis and direction finding uh, standpoint. Still learned a lot, but it also proved out these disciplines as uh, ways that uh, would produce information uh, eventually. This study was done largely for the education of the cryptologists, but incidental to this kind of training, the Navy organization learned exceedingly important information. It was a byproduct of training, but it attracted the attention of the senior figures in both the, uh, the Navy and the rest of the government. First of all, they were able to compile uh, a nearly complete list of all the combat ships in the Japanese Navy. As war broke out, this list was still valid, and it became exceedingly important for uh, intelligence officers in strike forces for determining uh, who their adversaries uh, were. They also learned the interesting fact that existing Japanese battleships were faster, better armed than anything we even had on the drawing board. This information caused the senior Navy uh, leadership to reevaluate our procurement program, and we designed and procured uh, battleships uh, that were much faster and better armed than anything we had intended, and were uh, giving us an edge over uh, the Japanese uh, uh, ship's uh, equivalent. The main code-breaking effort was uh, centered in the District of Columbia, but because communications then were uh, somewhat primitive, for long distance communications, they established some branch locations for the cryptologic organizations. One of them was at Pearl Harbor. It was known uh, eventually as Station Hypo. This is how uh, historians manage to refer to it. The building is still there. Uh, there is a plaque over the door. I think it's now being used as a storehouse. One of the things my office would like to do is have a real memorial there to uh, the cryptologists uh, at Pearl Harbor. The person put in charge of Station Hypo was Joseph Roachford. He was an expert code breaker. He had studied in Tokyo was fluent in the Japanese language, and he was totally dedicated to the job, which often uh, caused uh, the senior brass to uh, come down on him. He was never, of course, uh, disrespectful, never disobeyed an order, 
but he would get focused on the job. Uh, he would uh, spend several days and nights at Station Hypo, which meant he didn't take a shower. Uh, his desk was littered with wax paper from the sandwiches brought in. It was cold in Station Hypo, so he often wore um, a bathrobe around his uniform. Um, <clears throat> perfectly understandable when you know the environment and when you know the kinds of work he was doing, but not always guaranteed to um, meet with the approval of those who didn't know what he was doing or didn't know the environment. So he was constantly thought of as a sloppy officer. Uh, as uh, an officer without discipline. But, uh, in fact, he was uh, the driving force behind the early successes at Station Hypo. He worked with Admiral Nimitz's chief intelligence officer, Edwin Layton. Layton also had been a language officer in Tokyo. Uh, the fact that they had this common background helped them to work very closely together. And I think some of the successes that they achieved are uh, partly responsible to their compatible personalities. Uh, especially in the early days, Leighton was able to vouch for Rochefort uh, before the, some of the officers who might be critical of his uh, discipline. After some false starts, their main effort was against uh, a Japanese Navy code system, which we called JN-25. It was a mainline Japanese code used extensively throughout uh, Japanese forces. This is what they were confronted with. Just a, what looks like a bunch of random numbers. No sense at all. But they were expected to turn this into sense. Let's take a quick look at how uh, this operated. It started with a code book that had 30,000 words, give or take, in it. Once code book uh, word was, uh, was uh, chosen, that word or that uh, number would be super enciphered from a list of 100,000 random numbers or randomly generated numbers show you a hypothetical example. This is what a page from the uh, Japanese JN25 would have looked like. List of vocabulary words, like a dictionary, but instead of a definition, they have a five-digit number. When an officer wanted to send a message, he would give it to his code clerk. Code clerk would go to the code book, substitute that number for the word beside it. So far, so good but they would then go to a table of randomly generated numbers to be used as an additive. Let's uh, take a hypothetical example. You have the word from the code book. Uh, that word will always have the number 69186 connected with it. But then you go to the table of randomly generated numbers take the next available numbers, in this hypothetical example, it's at the top, and add them together in non-carrying addition. The product of that addition is what shows up in the message. So, what uh, the task was straightforward. You had to have a mathematically oriented cryptoanalyst figure out how to strip off that additive number seeing only the bottom line number, but strip off the additive number and get down to the code book number underneath. Then you had to have a Japanese linguist figure out what that number means in the Japanese language. So very straightforward. No computers, no handheld calculators. Now, if you understand what I've just said, and if you understand how to reverse engineer that, please uh, see me afterwards, and I'll put you in touch with our recruiting office at NSA. But <laughs> well, before the Japanese attack on Hawaii, they had made only a limited recovery 
from JN-25. The Japanese were very security conscious. They knew they were, that we were eavesdropping on them because they were eavesdropping on us. All countries do this against other countries they are worried about. And they took security measures. They would tweak their system so that every time the analysts at Station Hypo thought they were getting into uh, the system, something would change and they'd have to start over. Now, the attack on Hawaii is perhaps the, the worst day in America's 20th century. The United States was now at war with an army and a navy that was rated below that of, uh, I, I think, uh, Poland. We were facing the two most powerful militaries in the world, ill-prepared. So we needed the kind of edge that cryptology could give us. We needed to be able to put our forces where they would do the most good. Uh, and the only way to do that was through accurate and timely information. One of the things that happened after Pearl Harbor, however, that was of some benefit was that the Japanese decided not to tweak their code system as they had been doing. They now had ships across the Pacific that could be in combat at any time. They didn't want to lose a battle because some ship didn't get whatever tweak they needed that month. The code breaker's friend is a lot of messages in the same system. So before the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, the Americans we were able to solve about 10% of this JN25 code, not enough to read any messages. But very quickly after Pearl Harbor, we were able to read enough to make sense of many of the Japanese messages, thanks to the uh, analysis. Should also be said, this is also important, as was said in the introduction, let me reemphasize, the Japanese strike at Pearl Harbor was not to win a war against the United States. This is a myth. The Japanese struck at Pearl Harbor to put us out of the war. They did not want us to intervene when they attacked the Philippines or Southeast Asia. But our main naval weapon, aircraft carriers, though they were the Japanese target, were not at Pearl Harbor on December 7th. They were supposed to be, but they had been delayed returning from a mission. Heaven looks out for fools in the United States of America. I think the Pearl Harbor example proves that old cliche more than anything else. Very early in the uh, aftermath of Pearl Harbor, in the ability to discern Japanese uh, intentions through their messages, we learned that the Japanese were sending an aircraft carrier task force to Port Moresby, New Guinea. They had correctly uh, guessed or analyzed that the United States was going to use Australia as an unsinkable aircraft carrier to build up our forces for the counterpunch against the Japanese main islands. If they had a naval base on New Guinea, we wouldn't be able to do that. But as the Japanese themselves were planning this operation, the codebreakers at Pearl Harbor Station Hypo were reading many of their messages. We learned in a very accurate way the exact strength of the Japanese strike force and the date that the operation was due to commence. For the first time in naval combat, they not only had this strategic forewarning through solving a mainline Japanese code, they had eavesdroppers on the ship listening to the communications of the combatant ships during the battle. This was uh, important. It revealed many of the details of the Japanese 
tactical response to our presence in the uh, Coral Sea and revealed to us uh, their losses and sometimes revealed to us our own losses, giving the task force commander a much more accurate picture of what was going on during the battle to help him manage it. Now, the um, history books sometimes put down the Battle of Coral Sea as a tie because both sides had the same amount of losses. But it was actually an American victory. It was the first time the Japanese Navy had been stopped from getting anything it attacked. But we would not have even known they were headed for New Guinea if we had not been reading their messages secretly. As the battle for Coral Sea was going on, the messages that we were decrypting from the Japanese Navy indicated that they were planning uh, more operations in the Pacific, including possibly another strike at Hawaii. Admiral Nimitz, though a risk taker, wanted an edge was a calculated risk, not just a risk that he wanted to take. So he bore down on his intelligence staff. One tipping point was the famous Doolittle Raid over Tokyo in April 1942. This was direct retaliation on the Japanese homeland. Fine example also of Army-Navy cooperation in carrying out uh, uh, a delicate operation. The actual damage inflicted by the Doolittle Raiders in their famous 30 seconds over Tokyo was really minimal, but it was psychologically very severe on the Japanese. It was the Japanese 9-11. The Japanese homeland had not been successfully attacked uh, since the Mongols in the 13th century until the Doolittle Raid. So this inspired, uh, if not panic, at least a, a greater sense of urgency to get the American carriers that had been missed at Pearl Harbor. The assignment was turned over to Admiral Yamamoto Isoroku, the uh, commander of the combined fleet, the main, Japan main Japanese fleet in the Pacific. He was uh, perhaps one of the most brilliant strategic thinkers of the Second World War, particularly so since he understood how American Navy officers were trained and how they uh, reacted to different situations. He had been American Naval Attaché in Washington. He was the uh, poker champion of the diplomatic corps in Washington. Uh, but he had much interaction with American Navy officers, many of whom were at that time, his opponents, now, or were now by 1942 his opponents. He understood how they would react. And he and his planners came up with a brilliant plan to lure American carriers out of Hawaiian waters where they would have land-based aircraft to protect them uh, by attacking uh, the island of Midway, the last American outpost in the Pacific knew that Admiral Nimitz could not afford to lose it. There would also be a diversion operation towards the uh, Aleutian Islands uh, with the expectation that Nimitz would split his fleet. When one part of Nimitz's fleet responded to the initial attack on Midway, a second Japanese strike force would come up from the south, the two Japanese forces would catch the Americans between them and crush them. Those uh, assets that had been sent to defend the Aleutians would be ambushed by submarines. So it was a, uh, a very uh, complex plan for its time, but still uh, a brilliant one. But it began to unravel thanks to the decryption of Japanese messages. Through reading messages from the combined fleet, Station Hypo was able to follow the buildup of two task forces uh, that were being detached from the fleet for operations in the Western Pacific. 
and this included a landing or perhaps an occupation force. So this was not just a, a, a strike and, and run operation. This is perhaps the key part of what the codebreakers learned. This was not simply an attack to gain another island base. It was a, an attempt to trap the American fleet, to lure it out where it could be surrounded and destroyed. This would uh, greatly affect Admiral Nimitz's planning and decisions for the response to this. But in all these messages, the Japanese did not reveal the location of their initial strike. Everybody seemed to know what it was. Uh, they used an abbreviation, AF, an American something. Many of the Japanese designators for American uh, territory had been recovered, but AF had not. Joe Rochefort, the commander of Station Hypo, and Edwin Layton, the intelligence officer, based on other older messages, had a hunch that AF was midway. But a hunch was still not uh, up to the standard Admiral Nimitz needed for a calculated risk. So they came up with a clever plan, which Nimitz authorized. They had an undersea cable uh, or connection to uh, Midway Island that the Japanese could not tap. They instructed the garrison uh, at Midway to send a housekeeping message saying that their water filtration plant had broken down. They were running short of water, and of course they needed spare parts as well as uh, a resupply of water. Why did they do this? Because they knew the Japanese were eavesdropping on us the same as us eavesdropping on them. And yes, they broke a Japanese message about two days after this false message saying that uh, the Japanese were reporting that AF was short of water. Japanese Navy thought it had pulled off uh, a really important intelligence coup that would uh, help their invasion force and uh, they would be ready for a water shortage at Midway. What they had actually done, however, was confirm for the Americans the location of uh, their uh, impending attack. With further analysis, the uh, analysts at Station Hypo were not only able to uh, determine the target of the attack, but the date the attack would start. From their foreknowledge, built up early in the, uh, the war or in the last days of peace, they were able to give a really detailed, what turned out to be uh, an accurate uh, order of battle, listing all the Japanese ships that would be involved in the operation. So what did Nimitz know? Certainly enough for his calculated risks. Now, before each operation, the Japanese would not communicate. The ships traveling to strike Pearl Harbor in December 1941 did not communicate with Japan. The strike force headed for Midway did not communicate with their headquarters. So there was a period of doubt as to whether all the information that the codebreakers had developed actually was true. But as they moved into position to launch their attacks on Midway, the Japanese communicated with each other ship to ship. This was picked up by the tactical eavesdroppers, once again aboard ship as they had been at Coral Sea, some on uh, Midway Island itself. So they confirmed 
for the task force commander that the information on which our response was based had been accurate. The Japanese were there. And they were able to give a general idea of exactly where the Japanese were located. Uh, as the battle commenced, the Japanese communicated more. This triangulation of their signals was able to pinpoint much more accurately where their ships were actually uh, located. And the Japanese helped out themselves with some of their messages. It was a desperate fight on our part. We were outnumbered. Japanese were more experienced at combat than we were. But as the Americans began to prevail, Japanese messages revealed their losses and revealed the fact that they were uh, coming into desperate straits. Task Force Commander had to abandon his flagship and this was confirmed uh, partly by inference because his communications uh, had been transferred to another ship. They had communications they intercepted from Japanese pilots searching for their ship, their aircraft carriers uh, to find a landing spot. Their ships no longer were on the surface. The Japanese pilots had to ditch. But there were many desperate calls intercepted. Japanese retreated. They uh, increased their communications. I don't know if they had guessed we were eavesdropping on the, on the battle, but they made it sound as if they had about a third more ships than they actually did still active. And the loss at Midway was to be a military secret. We learned from Japanese orders that nobody without the need to know was to be told about the uh, outcome of the Battle of Midway. State secret. Admiral Nimitz rewarded those who had fought in the battle he also understood the role the Codebreakers had, uh, had made, uh, invited uh, Joe Rochford up for a, a, a bottle of champagne. Rochford was there uh, still working away in uh, Station Hypo in his uh, bathrobe. Uh, he quickly changed into a dress uniform and reported for his ceremonial drink. One of the great ironies of the story of Midway is the fate of Joe Rochefort. He was acknowledged by all the subordinate uh, codebreakers and other analysts at Station Hypo uh, to have been the driving force that brought them into a position to read the Japanese messages. But he had angered a few too many people uh, over the uh, undisciplined look that he had. He also believed he was working for Admiral Nimitz. The code breakers also had uh, a line of authority tracing to Washington, which resented his uh, emphasis on Admiral Nimitz. So uh, using their contacts in Washington, the uh, code breaking brass there, convinced Admiral King, the Chief of Naval Operations, to deny Rochefort uh, the Distinguished Service Medal that Nimitz had nominated him for. And Rochefort was uh, summar summarily transferred out of Pearl Harbor to command a floating dry dock uh, near San Francisco. Later in the war, he was, uh, to, to use a phrase from the Cold War, rehabilitated and he worked at uh, the OP20G headquarters in Washington, but never again uh, became a major factor, a uh, major force in, uh, in cryptology. Quote that I like, uh, Navy officer uh, on the uh, aircraft carrier Enterprise uh, 
he had been briefed before the battle on the enemy order of battle, but he had never been cleared for comment, so he was not told where the information had come from. And his reaction was, that man of ours in Tokyo is worth every cent we're paying him. Uh, and I think the codebreakers liked this sentiment. This is what they hoped everybody assumed about, uh, about their work. Chief of Naval Operations, just before the battle, said in a quote that I believe he continued to uh, uh, have faith in was that comment had been important. It was uh, important at Coral Sea. It was important at Midway. But if we lose it, if we lose this access, disaster will follow. One of the things that uh, was important about the battles of Coral Sea and Midway was that they educated American officers and um, gave them uh, uh, a stake in uh, understanding and using comment. Before, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of them had believed that uh, intelligence was mumbo jumbo, that it comes up by magic and may or may not be right. It, something like the, uh, the gypsy person in a tent at a circus midway uh, who look into a crystal ball and tell your fortune. Uh, but the actions at Coral Sea and Midway convinced the Navy leadership that communications intelligence was uh, the real thing, that it was an indispensable part uh, of all operations. After a... Um, period, comment became uh, a factor, a hidden factor, but uh, absolute factor that uh, guided most of the rest of the operations in the Pacific War. It's commonly known that our decision to land at Guadalcanal was because uh, an aircraft found, uh, uh, a reconnaissance aircraft saw the Japanese building an airfield there. The reconnaissance airplane was there in the first place because we had comment that said the Japanese were building an airfield there, and the uh, re reconnaissance plane just confirmed this. Most of the island hopping decisions were based on appraisals of Japanese strength on various islands. This continued to the end of the war. In August, 1945, the codebreakers encountered a Japanese word nobody had ever seen before in an encrypted message. As they studied it with the aid of a dictionary, they realized it was a new word, or at least a very little used word, that meant burn the emperor's portrait. The Japanese were going to burn the emperor's sacred portrait rather than let it fall into enemy hands. That meant the war was over. So this continued on through to the end of the war. Perhaps the best way to um, end this is to quote Chester Nimitz, uh, who shortly after the Battle of Midway, as the battle for Guadalcanal was unfolding, wrote, once again, radio intelligence has enabled the fighting force of the Pacific and Southwest Pacific to know where and when to hit the enemy. My only regret is that our appreciation, which is unlimited, can only be extended to those who are cleared or who can read this uh, system. So he was fully aware of the contributions that it made. And I should say, after the war, we got good. This support continues today. It still takes patience. It still takes, shall we call them, unique individuals. Uh, it still takes an education process for the uh, officers who will be recipients of the information. But the people who are the intellectual descendants of those who worked at Station Hypo are as dedicated to the task at hand and to protecting the United States through cryptology. And 
That's my story, and I'm going to stick to it. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'd be very happy to entertain any questions if I haven't already exhausted you, as well as the subject. Uh, yes, sir. There is a microphone uh, handy. Please use them if you ask a question. Uh, I'm Captain Hirata from Japan. Thank you for very good, uh, interesting uh, lecture and historical lecture. So my question about uh, this crypt crypto uh, problem. So. Actually, uh, uh, we uh, Japanese uh, officers uh, studied about it as a lesson learned uh, in a uh, uh, National Defense Academy or secondary school or anytime, anytime we studied about that. So, mm -hmm. actually, Japanese Imperial Navy continue to use same crypto, and also they couldn't recognize. Uh, United States Navy uh, already uh, understood mm -hmm. everything. So what is the cause of failure? Uh, it is a, a Japanese trait or character or uh, Imperial Navy's organizational problem? I'd like to know your opinion. Uh, well, if I understand your question is, uh, why, why were we so successful at this? Uh, it was not really a, a Japanese failure. It was, I think, the fact that the United States was desperate. We had to be innovative. We had to come up with an edge. And we were able to mobilize uh, some very unusual but brilliant people to do this. The Japanese also had some success against low-level American uh, codes. But they never, uh, as I understand it, uh, during the war, uh, put the emphasis on code breaking that they put into code making and uh, therefore did not have the same level of success uh, that we did. Uh, but uh, we did it because we had to. Perhaps not a satisfactory answer, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure how you measure uh, the other, dif other differences. I think there was one Japanese uh, problem. Japanese assumed they had a last line of defense. Uh, there's always, even if uh, they believed the code was unbreakable, uh, there's always the chance that somebody might lose a copy of it or it might be stolen or, or somebody uh, might sell a copy to uh, the enemy. Japanese seemed to believe that their language was so difficult for foreigners that uh, even if their code was compromised, there were no foreigners capable of understanding the underlying plain text, which I think was, was a key, key failure. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Uh, Commander Ben Boyard, uh, what kind of efforts did the US make when they were acting on intelligence to try to prevent uh, divulging the source of that intel? Yes, uh, good question. The rule in World War II was that no action should be taken on a piece of communications intelligence that would reveal its existence. That is, there had to be some cover story about how the information could have been acquired by other means. So in all theaters of war, uh, even when uh, comment revealed where the enemy was or where the enemy was moving to or what it intended to do, commanders would send out uh, various kinds of unnecessary reconnaissance. Uh, aircraft, sometimes land patrols or uh, small ship patrols, in such a way that the enemy would be aware of their presence. And the actions taken could be put down to good aggressive uh, patrolling and, and reconnaissance. And sometimes there were cover stories that were leaked through uh, using codes we knew the enemy could break. And we'd misdirect uh, reasons why we, we, we did an action. It was all um, up to the local commander not to uh, take a precipitate action that would reveal, or take an action that would be based only on comment or could have been based only on comment. Yes, hi. 
Thank you very much, Doctor. That was fabulous. I mean, I've picked up bits and pieces over the years, but never came close to the broad and intricate picture that you described. I have a question that is somewhat related, and what triggered my memory was our, our fellow uh, comment about Japanese, or your comment that the Japanese language was so difficult that they felt that that was their defense against intercept. Mm -hmm. yes. I've heard that the American Indians did something like that in World War II at the tactical level of communications. So they just simply spoke in their Cherokee or native American Indian dialects and languages, and it was never broken during the war. Um, that's correct. Uh, these were the Native American code talkers. Uh, they certainly spoke in their native languages, which were unwritten uh, and uh, little understood outside uh, those who had grown up with the language. Uh, but they also used an, uh, a kind of verbal code. The, uh, uh, they would substitute a word from their natural environment for the word of war. Uh, for example, the Comanches who did it would refer, they thought a machine gun sounded like a um, sewing machine, just louder. So they would refer to, in their messages to a machine gun as a uh, sewing machine weapon. Uh, the uh, Navajo who did it in the South Pacific would, uh, for example, refer to a uh, fighter aircraft as a chicken hawk uh, or a bomber as a pregnant buzzard, things like that. So there was a light, uh, sort of uh, uh, verbal code uh, along with their native language, which was tough enough. But there's a difference between solving Navajo, which is spoken by a couple of thousand, and uh, solving Japanese, which is uh, spoken by a hundred thousand. Right, thank you. Yes. Well, uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs>